Uh, hey guys, my name is Mpo, and I will be talking about the, how we automated uh, qualification testing for the 64 antenna Meerkat uh, array. Uh, how many of you guys know what this SKA is all about? Uh, this is going to be a tough crowd to <laughs> <laughs> Okay, tough crowd to impress. Um, so a little bit about myself, Mpo Pego, that's my name. Um, I'm a test and verification engineer, but I don't like the term. Hence why I didn't raise up my hand when Dan was asking, who's, he, who's a test engineer here? The reason behind that is that I don't see testing as something that you need to do at the end of the product or when you deploy. Uh, for me, testing has to inv involve uh, software development, and they have to go hand in hand. And uh, if you want to contact me, I've got my email address there, my personal, my work, uh, my GitHub, my blog. I usually write bl blogs and how-tos and stuff. You can check it out. Um, my presentation, if you want to link to my presentation or walk through with me, uh, the link below, you can check it out. I also have a Fiverr account. Uh, so for only $5, I can do a test suite for you. <laughs> okay, so what are we going to talk about? I'm going to give you a walkthrough of what uh, Meerkat is all about and what I do in the back end. Because uh, I was having a chat with a gentleman here who was asking me about someone who's in the software development, the guys that actually develop and give you all these images and not really talk about the guys that actually do the work. And I'm not saying that they don't, but yeah. It is what it is. <laughs> so um, I'm going to give you an overview of how we're doing the testing manually, um, and then how we decided to move over to automating everything, and also some of the challenges that I encountered. So like the tackle says, know where your text is going. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> So uh, the square kilometer array, we're building uh, an array of telescopes in the Northern Cape uh, in Carnarvon. And if you want to know more about what the SK about, uh, you can quickly go to that link. Um, this talk is not going to be about SKA as a whole. It's going to be about, uh, OK, my thing is not working. The whole Meerkat signal chain. Uh, so what you see on your far left is your normal antenna. And then you've got your antenna, you've got your digitizers, listening to an, uh, whatever, galaxy or whichever. All that signal goes through digitizers, get ADCs, goes through fiber to our uh, KDRA. I should have actually put an image, but OK, no worries. Next, next DevOps. Uh, <laughs> so where do I come in? I work for the correlator beamforming team. I am the test and verification engineer slash software quality uh, engineer, as I call myself on LinkedIn. Uh, <laughs> the Meerkat signal chain, uh, here's, uh, well, this is the block diagram, and this is where all the fun happens. So. It's funny that I uh, couldn't do a screen mirror, so I'm going to try to walk through here. So from your far left, you got your receptors, signals coming in, fibers. They're going to patch panels, fiber patch panels, and then they go to uh, switches. That's where all the fun occurs. Uh, the data get redirected to uh, what we call a correlator. And what is a correlator? Think of it. I always use the DSTV analogy, uh, not Netflix, DSTV. So I always do use the DSTV analogy as to, oh, no. I'm moving my cursor somewhere else. Yeah, there we go. I always use the DSTV analogy to explain how a correlator works and how we end up getting data from the correlator to uh, developing an image such as that one that was inaugurated in June by the vice president. So uh, basically, a correlator just correlates signals. 
that's what it does <laughs> <laughs> but there's uh, techniques in doing that <laughs> which i will not go into detail you can grab me later on and we'll talk about correlators uh, <laughs> So uh, this is an overview of how a correlator will the mind behind it. So you got your F engine and your X engine. Your F engine does your channelization, your FFTs, and then spews the data to X engines, which then do all the correlation. So you autocorrelate and cross-correlate, and then eventually you accumulate and you get your data dump out. And all these, especially for the 64 antenna, uh, we had, well, you'll see on the account, uh, challenges encountered. So when we, de we develop in-house, obviously we can't upscale. By that I mean we have to develop with very minimum uh, instrument, which is a scarab. Uh, what you see there is uh, our rack, so that's what makes a correlator. So you got FPGA boards, uh, Xilinx, um, I think it's Xilinx the Vertex 7 FPGAs in each and every board. And all these do the correlation of the data and spews it out to 40 gig uh, uh, Ethernet switches. And that data, the data rate is very high and capturing just a single accumulation, it's pretty much intense. Yeah, so all these are all interconnected using the CLOS network. So if you can read through I mean, the CLOS network, uh, the downsides and the upsides. Uh, so after vigorous challenges, uh, the guys decided to use a CLOS network. So we've got you, our spines and our leaf switches, and our scarabs are connected on our leaf switches, and our uh, Everything communicates via uh, the clothes network. So enough about that. Uh, we need to dive down to how we actually do the testing for these things. What do we test? Uh, we've got three major packages that we test. Everything is open source. It's on GitHub. We've got the core, core and Casper FPGA. The Casper FPGA, basically, we use it to communicate to the FPGA boards. And MCAT FPGA, that's our Bitstream repository where our DSP engineers do their MATLAB fun stuff. And then they put the FPGAs there for my team to test. We're actually a team of two. And um, the automating guy and the other guys, uh, he does a lot of switches and stuff. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's what we test. But then how do we test these things? We get requirements. Requirements are derived by system engineers. And we pretty much just make sure that uh, this is instrument, well, we actually implement the instrument and do what the instrument will, yeah, something like that. And then once we get those requirements, we have got um, some fun scripts which then export the functional requirements uh, from core, which we use, uh, to a JSON file, XML JSON file. We got our test suite that actually test uh, real time, the real time data coming out of the correlator. Uh, and those dependencies, we pull them off from GitHub and start an instrument remotely from the pilot's office. Uh, we remote in Carnarvon using fiber, fun stuff, fun times, and we actually test the stuff. And what happens is, uh, after all the tests is done, manually the way we used to do things, used to sit back, type in your nose test, blah, 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 enter, sit, and hope, and wait, and pray that nose test doesn't fail. <laughs> so we have since moved to uh, automating, as you can see, from the guy sitting at the back, you can easily see that, that that's a pipeline, that's a build pipeline. So you get the requirement, moves over, nose test, we generate reports, 
And then after some time, we review them and put them in our config management and never to be seen again unless uh, there's an ECP, then we have to redo the whole thing. So all the tests are being done to different instruments. So we got our 4K instruments and our 32K instruments. If you want to know more, we'll chat later. And all of this, the test suite is being designed with TDD uh, in mind. And what does TDD to me? I mean, what does TDD mean to me? Well, for me, you need to determine what you want to achieve, right? You need to know how you're going to achieve what you determined. And write test, verify what you have achieved, and then, well, obviously, if you're using TDD, the first test is going to fail, and we're gonna, I'm going to show you what I mean by that. Um, don't be dry, and try not to be wet. By that I mean, do not repeat yourself. Do not repeat yourself. <laughs> it's easy when you're, doing, when you're writing tests, you get, um, you end up repeating yourself in such a way that it causes problems over long term. Uh, you get memory leaks, you get unreadable code, Wasting time, wasting everyone's time, it's depressing. I always tell people that when in down, input this. <laughs> Try it, yeah. So, how I do TDD? Basically, I write the test first and run it and see if it's failed. And for me, TDD when you're doing no unit testing, you got a unit, which is an application logic, and you got your test. So the way I've done it, I don't know if it's visible, but if you want to know more, you can just go on the GitHub link and try to check. Okay, it's not. Uh, but it turns out the process com is completely different. The test develop the test driven, okay, I've got notes, I'm gonna be trying to read. The test driven development ask for developers to write tests first. And that's what we do. So as an example, we might have a method called test channelization, and we add some functionality to that. Uh, we compile it, we run it, and it passes. Uh, oh, wow. OK, that image, OK, I can't see that image. Oh, wow, OK. There's some fancy thing here. <laughs> <laughs> so the caveat to that, uh, this will not end quickly. Uh, TDD, it's, it's, it's intense. It takes time. You break things. You tell developers that they're breaking things. They come to you and scream at you and stuff. But it's fun times. <laughs> Seeing that you end up breaking everyone's code and telling them that uh, the coding skills is, yeah, that word. <laughs> so I've since implemented uh, continuous testing uh, using regression testing uh, by means of uh, Jenkins and Docker. So what is continuous testing? I think Yako spoke about continuous testing uh, in his last DevOps, which I uh, took some notes off and I implemented some stuff. So thanks to Yako. And, yeah. So what is continuous testing? Uh, it's an execution of tests repeatedly against a code or source code. And basically that's what we need to do. This initially was done manually using cron top, cron, cron, cron tabs and cron jobs. Uh, and then having to get to the office in the morning, go through logs, painful exercise. I wouldn't advise that to anyone. So, yeah. <laughs> hence why we ended up ditching manual and going to DevOps rule route of uh, continuous integration in CI/CD. So, I was uh, I had a challenge, uh, especially f a lone DevOps guy in a non-DevOps environment, everything that you need to do, uh, well, it's, it's, I, I, would, I would say, I would thank uh, the, 
uh, what was it? the ZA tech group for some ideas that I ended up implementing to get my whole build pipeline done. So I had a reason, and I decided to set up Jenkins uh, server on a Docker. So one of my, my, my the thing that I wanted to address was all the Jenkins configuration needed to be version controlled. So in my line of work, you need to version control everything from config files uh, to setups to uh, packages so that in case anything bad happens, you can roll back. Yesterday I had a chat with uh, another guy and he was telling me that they still use uh, email to version control. So his boss <laughs> <laughs> writes a code, <laughs> puts it in email, send it to him, he does whatever he does, send it back to his boss. And we're trying to avoid that kind of loop. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> so try to version everything. That's, uh, well, my initial, uh, why I decided. And all tests, I wanted all tests to be ran by an isolated user with very minimum uh, permission. And I wanted uh, to automatically uh, trigger Jenkins build uh, from a git push or git commit or web, web push. And at the end of the day, I wanted results. If there's any fails, create a Jira ticket. Yeah, Graham, I see you. <laughs> <laughs> create a Jira ticket. Notify me via email so that when I, when I get back to the office the following day, I know what I'm actually going to need to be doing. And I wanted to build uh, the Jenkins server. Uh, it, it needed to, to run locally on our correlator master controller in the Karoo. And I wanted to be eas easily build this Jenkins build with preferably one command. Because I know it, it, it can be painful to build Docker images, because you to write your Docker file, Docker build, Docker run, Docker stop. After, after some time, because I, I think yesterday in the open space, we hinted something about this as to how do you know where to mount your uh, images or your hard drive, and which port do you uh, put out? So I wanted something simpler to avoid that. And due to myself having OCD with bad code, I uh, wanted to integrate continuous code quality inspection using Sonacube. So how did I end up doing all this? Uh, I eventually automated everything with uh, make files. I'll quickly demo you if I'm going to try to be cut.
I actually wanted to show you guys how I actually build uh, my bot thing. How I do everything, but with the link below, you can check it out. And oh, my mic, mic dropped. So. Uh, Graham spoke about Fabric and how you can automate remote management system using Fabric instead of Ansible. So I have okay, this thing. There we go. Uh, so one of my thing, as I mentioned, I wanted to create two users. Everything needs to be needed, want, needed to be automated. So I use Fabric for automating all the boring stuff, which I, yeah. So you can check it out. I want to, it would have been nice to actually demo it. <laughs> <laughs> so after, after all this done, uh, you have your Jenkins running, and because everything is version control, I don't have to set up new builds or Jenkins files. Everything is version controlled. My configuration is version control. My testing is version control. So everything gets pulled in with only that one make file, uh, which is yeah, make bootstrap. And go oh, wow. Oh, screen. There you go. Uh, can you still hear me? Okay, cool. So. Graham spoke about uh, Git hooks on his last meetup uh, at the DevOps. And I took notes, went back to work, implemented those things, and they actually helped. Uh, so now, <laughs> they, they did, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I hope you guys are also taking notes because a lot of clever people have been coming here speaking about uh, things that you can take back home and implement, um, yeah. So if you're really interested on GitHub, uh, GitHub uh, hooks, you can check uh, my how-to, uh, which is the link below, and I also have my git commit and git pre-push, pre or yeah, pre-commit, pre-push stuff there. You can check it out. So what does this thing do? Every time I commit my code, it does linting. Linting, and then notifies me as to, okay, um, you need to fix it. The other thing is, I don't have to push and go to Jenkins to start a build. I figured that after some time, uh, it becomes uh, problemsome. And like I said, do not repeat yourself. Let machines handle machine stuff. So what happens is every time I commit, does linting. Every time I push, uh, it runs a build. And well, this applies across the board. Everyone that is using the computer, the the, the server, 
uh, every time they push, this is what's happened. And Sonacube. Uh, I met it a little bit. Uh, I was actually introduced to Sonacube about a few weeks ago. Uh, before then, I just used to use uh, PyFlake and linting um, and putting everything on HTML, which after some time, you ignore it. Uh, and, and a lot of people just push code, ditty code. So at least with uh, Sonacube, it made my life simpler. Every time you push, starts a, uh, you do a build, you do nose tests, you run your nose tests, and after that, it just runs uh, your Sonacube build. And with all these tests, you need to generate documentation. How do I do this documentation? I use Pocket Fix, and in the back background, I've mingled and played around with a few scripts to make it much more um, readable, I think, uh, for me. So, with all these tests that you've been that I've been doing that I got from SE System Engineering, run them, automatically generates a qualification report. And this is only done by just one click. And in the past, because uh, yeah, I remember when we were qualifying uh, the 16 antenna, we had to sit and do everything by hand. And I remember this one time, I left the office around at around 10 p.m. And it was not, um, yeah, you know, you know the end. So, <laughs> so as mentioned, um, in my whole, uh, the reason why I wanted to implement Jenkins and having everything running on Docker. I wanted reporting so that if there's any bug when this test or the build is running overnight, I'll be notified. And the person that actually created the bug will also be notified and be shamed by the whole organization. Yeah. <laughs> We, we don't do code conduct, <laughs> so everyone must know. If you're doing bad stuff, we must know. Everything before you push your changes, make sure that your code actually works. Because it's, it's really embarrassing sitting in meetings and pointing out like rookie mistakes, right? So in order for someone to avoid that, they actually have to do good code, make sure it, everything works before they get embarrassed. So, uh, okay, the images are not so clear as from my PC. So, my Jenkins build, in case of um, an error, creates a Jira report. And this was a test file uh, that I made. So, yeah. And, well, the types of challenges, oh, wow. The type of challenges that we encountered, like I said, um, upscaling can be cumbersome, uh, especially if you're working in an organization where you have to run these tests in real time and you're using up scientific time. Because for, for, for us to actually do, um, I mean, for scientists to actually run the thing, uh, I've been told that it costs about a thousand bucks a minute. So imagine you need to run tests that are going to take about seven hours to complete. How do you do that? It's going to be painful <laughs> to you guys who are actually paying the tax. <laughs> <laughs> it's a painful exercise. So what we have done is that we simulate everything. We simulate our sources, our digital inputs, and we play around with that. And the other problem that we encountered was how to subscribe to over 128 multicast addresses when you're only used to subscribing 16. We encountered that error, and I'm sure from my um, my link, because you, you can you can see the, the, the how I how I fixed the error, the issue on my uh, Google link down below. So from the hits that I've seen. Only on that link, it seems like a lot of people are experiencing the same problem, whereby when you're trying to multi, you to, to subscribe to multicast streams, you get, because um, I think the, the, there's an issue with the kernel, uh, Linux kernel, 
it uh, isolates you from subscribing to a lot due to security, network security and stuff. The other challenges, oh wow, okay. It's, it's not me, it, it looks nice on my machine. <laughs> it works in my machine. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the one line that you always hear as a test engineer, like, the thing works in my machine. I'm like, no, it doesn't work. <laughs> so another issue that we encountered was um, with Python, uh, if you're trying to open more than 1K file, files, you're going to encounter an issue where Python just bombs out and you're like, well, too many open files. And you need to close those open files. But what if you want to open actually more files than the limitations? What do you do then? There's a security, um, I think it's uh, file descriptors on, on, on your Linux box. But all the documentation and everything, because I try to document as much as I can on my blog. So yeah. go on my blog, make me money. Because yeah. <laughs> I want to get rich. <laughs> so yeah, those are the type of challenges. There's more, but I, due to time, I didn't really uh, document them. So what are the le lessons that I learned across this? Well, DevOps is a journey. like from where we were doing everything manual and leaving the office uh, the ungodly hours of the night and actually getting to a point where you automate everything. It's, it's a journey. And what you need to do, especially if you're dev DevOpsing in a non-DevOps environment like myself, uh, find a community and contribute and learn at the same time. Uh, find the guys at ZTag to be really helpful uh, uh, sometimes you get to a point where you're like, imposter syndrome, imposter syndrome. This guy's busy talking about Kubernetes and you're sitting there as an electrical engineer, not uh, computer scientist. You don't know what Kubernetes is. You don't know my SQL. You don't know .NET. You need to, well, how do you, well, uh, the, the way that I've overcame my imposter syndrome, Google and learn. <laughs> learn by doing. This is the best thing. If, if there's one thing I can tell you, learn by doing. Find something that you're passionate about and learn it. And do not ever repeat yourself. Automate everything. And yeah, please, yeah, the last line. <laughs> like I said, don't repeat yourself. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> Can you go back one slide quickly? Um, do drink water, seriously. Uh, kidney stones aren't fun. Yeah. Constipation is painful. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. But. <laughs> any Ooh. questions? No, no, any non-bodily non function related questions? Any non-technical <laughs> non questions? <laughs> no, any yeah, technical any questions? Oh, we can just chat later. <laughs> Here's the question, don't worry. Uh, hi. Uh, hi, nice talk. Uh, just wanted to check uh, what sort of data volumes are you handling in your test pipeline? <sighs> uh, Lots. Per second, a second dump, like a second accumulation, it's around four gigs. <laughs> yeah. So imagine trying to, because there's one test that uh, we run overnight, uh, where we have to sweep all across all channels. There's 32,000 channels. This test takes about six hours. And pray to God that you don't lose any connection or the system doesn't decide to stop. Because once it does, it's gonna, yeah, it's gonna take you, it's, it's gonna be a, a very painful exercise. <laughs> yeah. I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? There's one at the back. Thanks, Kubus. Oh, wow. Questions. Have you found aliens yet? Any? Aliens. <laughs> oh, not yet. OK. Uh, still, look um, <laughs> <laughs> still, still looking. There's a, there's a group. There's a group, the, the guys, the, the we're having a talk 
I'll, I'll share it on, on well, I'll, the mo when I put this thing on the interweb, I'll put a link. <laughs> cool. Serious question. I just want to confirm, you say you write tests, not the developer writes, the, writes his own tests? No, I'm, uh, I'm TDD. <laughs> 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 By that I mean I develop my own tests and write them. So pretty much software dev tech test engineer. No, no, hang on. Uh, you, you're testing your correlator. Yes, we're okay. testing the data coming out of the correlator. Do you, do you write the correlator fun uh, logic? Uh, the guys that I sit with do that. Okay, but no, that's my question. Are you testing your code or are you testing their code? Both. Okay, your, your developers therefore don't write tests. Yeah. Is that what you're yeah. saying? The developers don't write tests. I Whoa. do. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't kiss your cousin. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Maybe we'll take one more. <laughs> Two. Run, Kubis, down there. Go, Kubis. <laughs> Where's our who's, next who's speaker? Who's giving the next talk? <laughs> Where is he? I can't see him. <laughs> I think they should probably stand here next to me. <laughs> yeah. How do we get to play with your toys? Uh, everything that I have is on my GitHub. No, I mean the radio toys. Uh, <laughs> um, it's going to cost you, but you can, you, you can drop me a mail. I'll redirect you to the right people. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.